I think uh, Nigel Cooksley hit the nail on the head, actually. Um, it's called hand-arm vibration syndrome now. It's not a very... Um, not a very good title because, uh, certainly in England, uh, symptoms in the arm are not generally compensatable, so I understand, uh, if they can be attributed to vibration, and um, they basically can't be attributed to vibration. So it's really hand vibration syndrome, uh, previously called vibration white finger. And before that, in a more innocent age, when I was a medical student, it was called vibrating tool syndrome, which at least told you what caused it, if nothing else. And this is the sort of serious vibration which gives rise to hand-arm vibration syndrome, not the sort of floor-polishing stuff, but high, persistent, high-amplitude, uh, high-frequency vibration, day in and day out. And I took that picture off the website of Rail magazine, if any of you are train spotters. Uh, caused by prolonged exposure to heavy high frequency vibration it's an insidious onset it can be years and like a lot of other things which are not safe it, this is definitely a health and safety problem <clears throat> Havs consists of Raynaud's phenomenon well cyclical vasospasm at any rate sensorineural changes carpal tunnel syndrome and there may or may not be other forearm and upper arm symptoms which aren't recognised, uh, not by the Royal College of Physicians, in their reports on vibration-related disease. It's been recognised since 1911. It's only been properly quantified, well, 25 years probably. Uh, taylor Palmer scale was developed in 1975, and it's only been recognised as a compensatable disease in the last 15 to 20 years. I should probably have updated that slide a bit. Um, the Stockholm workshop looked at the taylor palmer score in 1987. I don't think anybody uses the taylor palmer score anymore because it mixes up um, vascular and neurological symptoms. And you can have just neurological symptoms or just vascular symptoms in hand-on vibration syndrome. Um, but the Stockholm scale looked at each hand separately, divided the condition into two parts, and discounted seasonal variations in symptoms. So it's a minefield, really, at making a diagnosis, because the problem with hand-arm vibration syndrome is that there is no test that you can do, no simple test which says this is vibration-related. And you fall back on history, examination, and special investigations, which is how any clinician diagnoses anything. And three-quarters of diagnoses in the whole of medicine are made on the history alone, um, you're up to about 90% on examination and special investigations largely just confirm the diagnosis if there are diagnoses and in HAVs you're often investigating to exclude other conditions rather than to uh, prove that they've got vibration related disease on the Sherlock Holmes basis that you know when you've excluded everything else whatever's left however unlikely must be the truth I don't really subscribe to that as you will see <clears throat> There must be a reasonable history of vibration exposure. I don't believe it's up to the medical expert to say that, although if somebody's been leaning on a pneumatic drill eight hours a day for 20 years, I think that's a reasonable assumption. There must be some history of vibration exposure. It should be heavy. Um, it can be quantified, and there are industry experts who do this. They calculate something called the action potential, A8, and they, they end up with a figure. They take a square root, and they put it on a graph. And if it's above a certain line, they've got it. And if it's below the certain line, they haven't. And that's usually where the arguments start. But you need a past family and social history, which screens the patient for other possible causes. There are drugs that can cause uh, vibration-like symptoms. You want to know about their allergies, their general health. And then, uh, based on the history, you provide a score. And it's very much down to what the patient tells you, which puts everybody at a slight disadvantage. I did some cases not long ago where there were seven people on a gang and I reckon that two of them had got it and five were slipstreaming behind them. Maurice Reynaud worked at the uh, Pitié Salpêtrière, which uh, is where they took Princess Diana in 1862 and he described spasmodic demarcated blanching, not blotching, with a blue phase. The fingers go white and then they go blue and then 
the basal spasm is released and there's a red and painful revascularization phase and then it returns to normal and it's usually about over 20 minutes but there's a vast range people sometimes don't have the blue phase they nearly always have the red phase uh, it's nearly always painful when the blood supply comes back and it can last a couple of hours even longer um, and it can be quite a devastating symptom and when I take the history I always ask if they've seen the GP and if they haven't seen the GP, then maybe they haven't got very bad symptoms. That's a, it's not a very good picture. It's a bit blurred. I got that off the internet. You very seldom actually see an episode of blanching in a patient, but that's what you should get. A lot of people say it should be circumferential blanching, but as long as it's reasonably demarcated, that gives you the diagnosis. And I don't know if I've got a pointer. Have I got a pointer? Have I got a pointer? You see, that's not circumferential, but it's demarcated. That's circumferential. That's circumferential. Um, and just because that's not circumferential, you can't say that it's not Raynaud's phenomenon. Okay, there's the man himself. In 1875, he said, I am not yet in a position to formulate a complete treatment for this condition. In fact, what he's really saying is that we haven't the slightest idea how to treat this condition. And in many respects, we still don't, although there are some promising new drugs. Uh, Raynaud's phenomenon is that cycle I explained, where it goes white and then blue and then a painful rib recovery phase. Raynaud's phenomenon can be caused by a whole load of things. And if you strip out most of these things, which I won't burden you too heavily with, um, and can't find an underlying cause, you are normally left with a group of people, three quarters of whom are women, who have got what some people call constitutional Raynaud's which I call Raynaud's disease. Um, and half of them get it when they start their periods, and half of them get it when they stop their periods. And it's therefore got something to do with oestrogen, though nobody's quite worked out what yet. Um, research in Raynaud's has not got very far in the last few years. Um, but there are one or two interesting features coming up. But that's Raynaud's disease, not caused by vibration, not Raynaud's phenomenon. These conditions, scleroderma, systemic lipoceratitis, rheumatoid arthritis, polyarthritis, and those uh, Sjogren's disease are all autoimmune diseases, and they are all rare, and I mean very rare, but they do, they can cause Raynaud's type symptoms. Carpal tunnel syndrome I'll come on to. Uh, trauma, vibration, arterial disease, you can get Raynaud's phenomenon in you know, vascular disease, atherosclerosis, smokers. There are a load of drugs that can cause it. Uh, there are some neurological problems that can cause it. And there's cryoglobulinemia, which is a rare cause, um, which is to do with the uh, hemoglobin coagulating if the temperature in your fingers fall. You've got abnormal sensitivity to cold, um, etc. And etc. accounts for 0.001% of the cases, I think. Um, done all that. In Raynaud's disease in women, it tends to be bilateral, same in both hands. And in hand-arm vibration syndrome, it can be patchy. It nearly always spares the thumbs, which is a good idea not to tell the client that, because that will that sorts out some of the uh, fraudsters. Uh, and it's patchy. It's not. It's not bilateral. It's not mirror image. It often occurs in just the trigger finger. You know, if somebody's been using a drill like this for twenty years, they only get the Raynaud's phenomenon in those two fingers or those three fingers. Um, and that is not at all unusual uh, to see um, patchy disease. Uh, Renner's disease, there's a local fault and it's probably hormonal. In Habs, there is definitely local damage both to the vessels and to the nerves. Prolonged vibration exposure causes thickening of the lining of the vessel, neointimal hyperplasia, and also demyelination, which removes the outer coating of the nerves and prevents them from conducting properly which causes the sensorineural symptoms, which are tingling, numbness, and reduced tactile agility. And as you go up uh, the Stockholm scale, um, the symptoms are worse as you score them. Reduced tactile agility means it basically you can't pick up a paper clip. A lot of the patients say that they can't tie the knots when they go fishing. You'd be surprised how many people who work with vibration fish in their spare time. Um... What else causes sensory neural symptoms? Well, peripheral nerve entrapment. Ulnar nerve entrapment can cause tingling and numbness in the hands. Um, peripheral neuropathy, 
which is damage to the peripheral nerves due to other things like diabetes, alcohol, various toxins, various drugs. Uh, doctors cause all sorts of diseases by giving patients drugs. And then central nervous system disorders, spinal cord disease, multiple sclerosis, degenerative disease, um, and there are plenty of those to choose from, and injuries to the arm and the neck. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, carpal tunnel syndrome is a problem. Um, the Royal College of Physicians report 1993, which I'll come to, includes carpal tunnel syndrome as uh, one of the three features of hand arm vibration syndrome vascular, sensu neural, carpal tunnel. And their latest report, which was produced by their occupational health division, which was 2004, which is a thick volume, which of course is now eight years out of date, says that carpal tunnel syndrome is related to vibration, but it's not related to the dose in the same way that the vascular symptoms are. Well, hang on a minute. If it's not related to the dose, how can you say that it's related at all? You know, this chap's been uh, exposed to vibrating machinery for a week. He's got carpal tunnel syndrome and no other risk factors. Does that mean that the vibrations cause the carpal tunnel syndrome? So it's, it's actually very difficult to sort this out. And I'd like them to have other symptoms as well, as, as vascular symptoms and sensory neural symptoms. If it's pure carpal tunnel syndrome, I think it's quite difficult to prove that that's related to um, hand arm vibration syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome, you get tingling in the thumb, that finger, that finger, and that half of that finger in some patients, depending on the distribution of the nerves. It's caused by pressure against the carpal tunnel there, uh, and hand pain often wakes the patient at night, and is often referred up the arm, which is a bit of a red herring. Um, it's seen most commonly in obese patients and pregnant patients, and I've, as I've yet to see a woman with hand arm vibration syndrome, um, that's difficult. And there are some judges I've come across who ignore it, you know, despite the fact that the College of Physicians say it is. They, say, they, they pass judgment and say that it isn't caused by vibration. Uh, that's the anatomy. There's the carpal ligament across here. The nerve goes through this tiny little hole called the carpal tunnel, along with all of the tendons in the hand, of which there are ten. Um, you see, the median nerve can get quite easily trapped, but it's not trapping that is the cause of the symptoms in hand-arm vibration syndrome, it's demyelination. The nerve is directly damaged. And this has been proved. There are papers where people have biopsied the median nerve. And the treatment is non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, you know, Brufen, um, oral steroids, steroid injection, and if they don't work, then you can cut through the ligament and release the pressure, just cut through that, release the pressure on the wrist, being not careful not to cut through the palmar arch in the hand. Um, steroid injection is temporary. Now, operation is less likely to provide relief in patients who are vibration exposed because it's not caused by pressure. There may be some pressure involved. Um, but it's not an operation which provides good patient satisfaction, even in patients who've got pressure symptoms, I've found. I used to do it quite a lot. I still do occasionally. Um, but it's not a bad diagnostic test, actually. If they have the operation, they're heavily vibration exposed and there's no improvement, then I would be happy to put in a report that it's more likely not due to vibration. Um, ulnar nerve compression is this nerve that comes around here and it causes tingling and numbness along here. And that is uh, a red herring, complete confused with the sensory neural symptoms of halves. Mixed disease, if they've got carpal tunnel syndrome and sensory neural symptoms, tingling and numbness, um, it can often be quite difficult to distinguish which is due to what. But if they've got carpal tunnel syndrome and they've got permanent numbness and inability to pick up things and it extends right across the fingers then that's probably mixed disease. Carpal tunnel syndrome by itself only affects those fingers. I suppose they could have ulnar nerve disease and carpal tunnel disease and not, well you see the problem. And then I won't go into the musculoskeletal things, reduced grip strength, pain in the hands and the arms. And these are generally symptoms suffered by men who have been heavy manual laborers all their lives, whether that's compensatable or not. I'm not a solicitor. Scoring. The Taylor Palmier, that's the Taylor Palmier score, which you can see uh, mixes up blanching and numbness. I won't dwell on that. I no longer use it. Um, we've been into that. 
Stockholm scale, the vascular component, this is being, being revised. I do not think there's 2V early and 2V late now, which some people are using, but it's not in common uh, usage. Um, nought, of course, is no attacks. 1V is mild, just the tips of one or more fingers. Two occasional attacks at distal and middle phalanges, that's up to here. Uh, stage three is right up to here, and stage four is when the tips of the fingers are going black. You do see that occasionally, and some people are tremendously sensitive to the vibration and develop tropic changes after only about a year's work with vibration machinery. Sensory neural component, vibration exposed but no symbols, oh, typo, uh, with, but no symptoms is naught, of course. One SN is intermittent, two SN is intermittent or persistent with reduced sensory perception, intermittent numbness. Um, oh, sorry, tingling with reduced sensory perception, and three is persistent numbness and reduced tactile de dexterity. So if the patient can't pick up the paper clip or can't die as fishing knots, that propels them into 3SN immediately, and you score the hands separately. This advantage is it's subjective. Stage two is definitely too wide, and I think stage two early and stage two late will become de rigueur fairly soon now. Um, and words like occasional and frequent are simply not defined, and you may need additional tests to quantify it. The latest revision is Gothenburg 2008, where Griffin, and I've, I've put two of Griffin's papers in the bundle. Griffin is an industrial expert, and he has suggested further revisions to Stockholm scale, which to me look quite sensible, uh, but which haven't been adopted yet. Um, have a look at the papers. There are, um, I hate to break it to you, but there are equations in some of these papers. Try not to worry about it. I have found I can still understand them without bothering to understand the equations. I'm not very good at equations. But they, they're a good read. They're very interesting insight into the industrial side. This is the numerical scoring system. So if you just get blanching in the tip of the fingers, that's, uh, you, you score it. And the maximum score for the thumb is nine and for each finger is 6. So a full score would be 33 if you had blanching of everything. But most people are just confined to the fingers, not the thumb, and they might score oh, 3, 3, 6, 3, something like that. Not 3, 3, 6, 3. So on the basis of that scoring system, how would you score that? That's a medical student's hand, by the way. Would he care to hazard a guess? We're going to be here all day, otherwise. Um, that's the answer. Okay, so it's not three 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 one on the right, because on the right it's only above the tip of the finger, and on the left it's not three 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 because it goes up into the second part of the second phalanx. All right, probably. Um, physical examination. Uh, they should all have a full general examination, pulse, blood pressure, listen to chest, listen to heart, all that stuff. And then there are specific tests for vascular and neurological disease in the neck and arm, most of which can be backed up with a test to exclude other things but not to diagnose hand arm. Done all that. Adson's and Allen's test, Tienel's test, Phelan's test, and the moving two point discrimination test. Adson's test is for the occlusion of thoracic outlet syndrome. <laughs> There's a 15% false positive rate, there's 15% false negative rate as well. And I prefer doing a duplex ultrasound. You shove the patient's head over to one side and pull on the arm and feel the pulse. And if it disappears, they've got thoracic outlet syndrome. Well, maybe. Well, that's Adson's test. Allen's test demonstrates the blood flow to the hand by testing radial and ulnar arteries. Doesn't provide information about the palmar arteries but it will enable you to pick up things like you know, Nigel's favourite um, uh, hypothena hammer syndrome, for example, in which the ulnar artery is often blocked. Um, that's a hand, same medical student. You get them to make a fist, and then you press very hard on the radial and ulnar pulses there and get them to open their hand, and it's white because making the fist has got rid of all the blood. And then you take out, I've uh, taken my finger off the radial pulse, and the hand's gone red so you know the radial artery is working. You then do the same thing, take your finger off the ulnar pulse, and the hand goes red again. You know the ulnar supply is supplying the hand. Uh, and it's actually basically testing the circulation around here, because if you can feel pulses, you know it's all right up to there, uh, but it's testing the pulse further down. Um, 
and I'll go into more complex stuff in a minute. Tinel's test for the diagnosis and exclusion of carpal tunnel cystic syndrome is much more effective. You basically whack the patient's um, carpal tunnel with a uh, patella hammer, and if they go, ow, it's positive. <laughs> well, doctors are like that. You know, never trust a doctor who says, this won't hurt a bit. A little tip for you, all right? Phelan's test puts pressure on the carpal tunnel. Again, it's quite sensitive and specific. Um, you get them to sit like that with some pressure on, you know, holding their hands down like that for three minutes. And then they, if they've got carpal tunnel, it would get tingling in the thumb, index, and middle fingers, possibly. The moving two point discrimination test is simply a test of the sensitivity of the hand, sensory test. Three millimeter threshold, so if it's four millimeters, it's positive. Um, and uh, you can use, they're very complex and expensive devices for doing this. I find a bent paper clip works very well, uh, measured against a ruler so that you know how far apart the tips are, and um, keeps the cost down. And um, they say whether or not they can feel one or two points. All that does is test whether they can feel anything. It doesn't tell you whether it's due to vibration or not. Okay. Investigations, I find that complex investigations are normally only needed if there's a major dispute, all right? It's usually if the defense say, oh, this isn't, and they put up an expert to say, oh, it could be such and such, it could be such and such. You get into rarer and rarer conditions and you end up excluding more and more rare conditions, um, when in fact it's obviously due to vibration. Am I right for time? Um, you can engage an industrial expert, which will give you a guide of whether they have really had enough exposure or not. And these guys will go around to the factory and identify the machinery that the patient has actually been using, look up the action potential provided by the machinery in a textbook, in a, a you know, spreadsheet, and then note down the length of time the patient has been exposed and work it out. And the second paper by Griffin, Neglect Negligent Exposure to Hand Transmitted Vibration, which is also in your bundles, is all about that. Uh, again, they're not always right, but largely. And you can test for all these things, rheumatoid factor, in case they've got rheumatoid disease. You can, there are specific tests for connective tissue disorders. You can do nerve conduction tests to exclude other causes of um, sensory neuropathy. Uh, thrombophilia screening is to do with whether you're inherently disposed to clotting your blood. And then there are various ultrasound tests and thermography. Simple ultrasound. That'll tell you whether the palmar arch is working. You can trace the arteries down the hand using a handheld Doppler, basically. Or you can use duplex ultrasound, which is much more complicated, the same medical student, uh, which gives you a picture. In this case, looking in the neck, you're looking at the carotid bifurcation, and uh, that's basically the external carotid artery which supplies the face, that's the internal carotid artery which supplies the brain. And this particular patient has a nasty tight stricture there, which means they need a dangerous and expensive operation. Thermography, well, you can use it. I mean, it's basically for thermal rewarming. You cool the patient's hand off and then stick them in front of a the thermo, thermo, thermal camera in a temperature control room and see how long it takes them to warm up. And that gives you a very good idea of whether they've got vasospasm or not. And then treatment. Nifedipine, there are various other drugs. Um, uh, some of the antidepressants work quite well. You can give them heated gloves. Some patients who are in a particularly bad way end up with prostacycline. I've got a, a case on the go where a patient has to be admitted for prostacycline. Avoid trigger factors, you know, do not pick up vibrating machinery, stay out of the cold. None of it's all that successful, I'm sorry to say. Um, if you stop vibration exposure, the vascular symptoms tend to improve and the sensory neural symptoms don't. And if they haven't improved two years after um, cessation of vibration exposure, they're not going to improve. If symptoms start more than two years after cessation of vibration exposure, then it's unlikely to be due to the vibration. It's more likely to be due to something else. And that's in the Royal College of Physicians report. Um, this is the Griggs case, actually. Um, lifelong exposure to vibration from a jackhammer and cold hands. I thought he'd got spasmodic Raynaud's disease. The expert on the other side thought not. He thought he'd just got cold hands. It was actually seen by several experts. Um, I got him back again and we tested him to perdition. Couldn't find anything else the matter with him. Um, the duplex showed an occluded palmar arch, which is the blood vessel in here, which supplies all the 
vessels to the finger. And the power arch is right where you are leaning on the jackhammer for 10 hours a day, 40 for 40 years, basically. That's his thermogram. It shows that his fingers really are very, very cold. Black is cold. And the court case was definitely difficult. We ended up with a live Doppler demonstration and the judge accepted Palmer Arts disease as part of hand-arm vibration syndrome and Nigel Cooksey knows more about what happened after that. Uh, the question is, can Palmer Arts disease result from vibration exposure? And I think so. Uh, and certainly the, the um, Court of Appeal thought so as well. So... Then you carry on, if the case is complicated and is being heavily contested, you end up going through with a fine-toothed comb, the GP notes, the hospital notes, the various statements of witness, the medical reports on both sides. You end up having to try and agree a joint experts report with somebody who is implacably imposed to make it the same diagnosis as you are. You may have to take account of the industry report. Part 35 questions, it's often related to proportional liability. These questions are very difficult to answer if you're thinking of setting any. Um, you know, the chap's worked for eight different employers and his symptoms start when he's working for the last employer and they write back and say, well, you know, how many of the previous employers are responsible for giving him hand arm vibration? Well, I don't know. Um, I think if the symptoms come on more than two years after employment with the last employer, then you can say that really it's, it was just down to the last employer uh, on the basis that if symptoms don't appear within two years, then, it will, you know, what I said earlier about the two-year um, uh, stop. Uh, if they've started in less than two years after starting with the last employer, then obviously the previous employer has got some liability. Um, probably all of his employers have some liability and it's just taken 20 years for the thing to um, develop. But can you quantify that? I can't. And then solicitors are often confused over the components of hand-arm vibration syndrome. They think that vibration white finger is the same as hand-arm vibration syndrome when it isn't. Vibration white finger, which is an old term, just relates to the Raynaud's phenomenon, not the sensory neural component or the carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and uh, often the work record uh, provides valuable clues to what's going on. There are published reports, as the Royal College of Physicians 93 and 2004, the British Standards Institute and the European Standard Reports are very heavily relied on by vibration industry experts. Uh, the Work-Related Upper Limb Disorders Report by Social Security and the HSG 88 Report are relied on very heavily by um, state compensation bodies. Uh, the college report is a very good guide, clinical guide to diagnosis, um, outlines the various scales, suggests clinical tests for excluding other things, and um, the latest, the second report, has got much updated literature. Um, I think I've probably reached the end of my time. I can skate over those. Uh, that's the best one. I would regard that as a good read. Uh, £52 from a well-known internet bookseller. Um, well worth reading. Faculty of Occupational Medicine, Royal College of Physicians. I think you can order it off the Royal College of Physicians website. You don't have to be a doctor, I do know that. And then what happens next? All of these things has happened to me. Write, sign and send report, wait for further joint instructions, endless meetings with counsel, court date, exchange of revised documents by email at three in the morning, frantic last minute phone calls, settle out of court on the morning of the case when I'm already on the express to Manchester agonising court battle, cut opponents, expert, dead, verdict, and then a very long time later sometimes. 